Hello, and welcome to the Author's Den podcast, where we help authors share their message to the world. Join us as we feature unique conversations and get ready to be inspired. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome to Author's Den. How are you doing this afternoon, evening, morning, uh, midnight, three o'clock in the morning? I don't know where you are in this beautiful uh, world that our our creator has created. Uh, I am your host, Lizzie. I am one of the hosts of Authors Day, and I'm so honored and privileged to be here uh, sharing with you another incredible author, another incredible star, another uh, a little bit of a controversial, as always, we have controversy always in this show, and uh, I am so, so excited to bring uh, to you uh, an incredible uh, story, and again, um, you have questions, or you have, uh, you want to be able to get a hold of this, the book that we're going to be discussing today, make sure that you follow us on all social media, especially the website, uh, Authors Den, the author, author Den that is uh, on our website, which has incredible resources and incredible, incredible um uh, links for you to be able to purchase the book that you're looking for. Uh, so today is definitely not going to be the exception. Uh, we have with us today, uh, as I mentioned, an incredible author all the way from the States, our brothers and sisters in the States. Uh, I mean, we get them from all over the world, but uh, the States seems to be one of the places the that uh, we are uh, always interviewing or talking to uh, the author. So it is going to be an incredible, incredible um, talk today, and I'm hoping not to disappoint you. Today we have uh, international author Curtis Woods. Curtis Woods has, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, written a a very interesting book. Uh, It is um, uh, called uh, The... uh, Hmm, the percent devil, their satanic tools uh, book, and one uh, percent devils and their satanic tools. Now, a lot of you are, pro- oh no, 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 Lizzie, is this going to be a religious uh, uh, talk? Well, uh, we have different topics and we have different points, and we have to respect uh, the the author's point of view, and I respect it hugely. I think it takes a lot, a lot of. Uh, a lot of courage to be able to come out and say uh, what you what, what is in your mind, what is in your heart, what is in your soul, what God tells you that you should be sharing. Uh, a little bit of background on Curtis, uh, Curtis, Mr. Curtis Wood. Uh, he is um, he is also um, an incredible, educated person. So we're not talking just somebody who is just uh, you know. Uh, without any background, uh, standing with his re- grandfather, uh, Leas Booth, as a Lutheran minister at law with a PhD in philosophy, law, and uh, 30, 32 second degree free of men's. And uh, so there is uh, there's a lot of um, uh, a background and a lot of information. And I think you are definitely, definitely going to enjoy it and uh, be surprised uh, of some of the answers and questions that we're going to be posting uh, for for you and for, for my guests right now. But I'm not going to detain you too long, everyone. I don't want to make this long. I want to make this uh, interactive and definitely get points of the author that uh, are people wondering. A lot of people have questions about what's going on or, or uh, what's going on with politics. Are, are they involved in things that are not not godly? Uh, are they being part of uh, rituals and, and things? We all have questions. And some people have re- done a lot of research and, and, and uh, they want to share with you. So without further ado, everyone, uh, let's welcome to the stage um, Curtis Woods. Controversial book, but an interesting book. And uh, one of the things that uh, that I, I admire you, Curtis, is the courage to be able to put this book through. So welcome. How are you doing? Well, um 
I'm nervous, you know, like I w would have been uh, just before I started a trial. But <laughs> once I get into this, um, I'll relax and, of and we'll, we'll roll with it. Well, of course, of course. Curtis, just relax. And one of the things that I not 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 to be nervous. I'm we're here to have a conversation and to be able to to share with my audience, with the authors and audience, your point of view and your research and and what you have discovered. And obviously, this is. Uh, you take it as a grain of salt. People are going to do their own research. They're going to take their own conclusions. But it's really nice, and it's really interesting to know your point of view and what you have found. Uh, one of the things that I always ask my authors, and I mean, you have a lot of background. You're a very educated person. You know your stuff. It's not like you came from nowhere and you decided to write this. But writing, um, you studied. You've you've you have a lot of education. Was writing part of your life from the beginning, or you started to do this later on when you know when God called you, or when you just you have the desire of sharing things with the world? How did writing came part of your life? How did what? Uh, writing uh, was it? You always you always wrote books, or this is something that came later on in life? No, I was 16 years old when I first wanted to, uh, you know, start writing books. But uh, I then I uh, and my goal was eventually became to start writing books, you know, before I was 55 years old, and uh, so. That's Good for it. you. That's uh, that's that's incredible. Yeah, sixteen years. I don't I don't remember me thinking at a sixteen year old, uh, you know, to write to put a book through or, or have something to say. So good for you, uh, to to be able to wake up to that calling and and answer it. So that's awesome. Let's talk about the nitty gritty. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. Let's talk about this controversial book that you have written and the title um, is, is very interesting and a lot of people are probably going to wonder what is this all about what would you say what kind of inspiration what kind of calling what what gave you the the, the inspiration to write this book well I saw that uh uh, there was a, a substantial portion of this country who wants to eliminate democracy and moral capitalism and turn this country into a neo-fascist or neo-Nazi new world order. And so that's what the, the main motivation was. And I personally, I, again, everyone, this is my personal view. I'm not. Uh, this is not the, the the view or the of of all my listeners. I understand and I respect that. But I will, I agree with you, Curtis. That absolutely, we're going to that. And as as we all, some of us who like to read the precious word, we can see that that's happening. It's all getting ready uh, for the time uh, where New World Order is going to take place. And uh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, this controversial book was part of, of uh, an inspiration, and you wanted to awaken, if I may say so, people out there. What would people expect uh, for what would they hope uh, for the readers to take away from this book? Well, geez, I, that's going to take us a whole period of this uh, interview to to answer. And, and, and what... it's a, we we have a little bit of time, uh, Curtis. So I, I I would say that you should definitely uh, share with us because a lot of people are probably looking for some of the answers as you have found. And so, what was your question? Uh, the uh, the takeaway, the expectation, what would uh, readers that are listening to us all over the world, they they would expect from uh, this book? Well, most important, uh, does four professions share a moral, legal, 
and U.S. constitutional crisis. Uh, as to a political crisis, satanic tool Republican voters, politicians, preachers, and press are anti-Christ traitors to the U.S. Constitution. They want to unconstitutionally eliminate votes by Democrats in order to replace democracy and moral capitalism with a Caucasian, Anglo-Saxon, New World Order that would be as evil, tyrannical, and immoral as Nazi, fascist, and communist New World Orders. Republican traitors violate six goals in the preamble of the U.S. Constitution, 13 of its provisions, and all freedoms and rights in the Bill of Rights. Antichrist Republicans violate 15 commandments and all of Christ's principles of how people should treat each other. And Republicans' immoral means to immoral anti-Christian unconstitutional ends include 22,000 Orwellian repetitive lies by Donald Trump, so voters believe the lies are truth and truth is a lie, and Hitler, Nixon type, Machiavellian divide and conquer wedges of tactics. However, Republican President Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided among itself cannot stand. But neo-fascist, neo-Nazi, Trump cult Republicans divide the USA by stimulating racial, cultural, ethnic, religious, and gender bias and prejudice and hatred in uneducated, brainwashed voters with low self-esteem who have a sociopathic need to elevate their own low self-concepts by denigrating everyone who is not an anti-Christ Caucasian traitor. And ironically, when they vote Republican, they vote against their own rights, freedoms, family, social, and economic interests, such as Obamacare, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, Disability and Retirement, Veterans Benefits, Welfare, Food Stamps, Housing, Higher Minimum Wage, Unemployment Compensation, Workers' Compensation, Product and Product Safety. Lies and Machiavellian tactics are repeated in evangelical churches and every hour on the hour by Republican propaganda me news media such as Fox News and the Internet. As to a religious crisis, the last time I attended church, the preacher said in a sermon uh, one Sunday, you cannot be a good Christian unless you come to church on Sunday. Later, I said to the preacher, we are good Christians when we honor commandments and Christ's principles. Those who destroyed my family and careers went to church on Sunday and sinned on Monday. That may not have happened if Christian sermons taught all 15 commandments and nine principles of Christ. However, Christian ministers are reluctant to pre preach more than one commandment and Christian principle each Sunday due to reluctance to offend large offering plate givers such as politicians, attorneys, doctors, business owners, bankers, sales and repair people who lie and commit adultery, thefts, and fraud. So I said that preachers and priests should give sermons on several commandments and principles of Christ and theory of law by St. Thomas Aquinas, a book written in code to prevent the Pope from burning him at the stake. What Aquinas said was that God's plan for mankind is a utopia or garden of Eden or heaven on earth free of wars and crimes due to a universal covenant or promise by all peoples to comply with natural law, civilized law, uh, eternal law, principles of Christ and God, and positive law. A utopia where basic needs for food, clothing, shelter, and medical care are met. Everyone who, who wants more than basic needs can achieve to their fullest potential in education, training, a trade, business, profession, government, or service industry, and everyone has opportunities to relax and enjoy families, beauties of nature, art, music, sports, theater, sex, and other gifts of God. St. Thomas Aquinas also said 
that mankind's goal is happiness. Democrat politicians vote to achieve God's plan uh, for mankind and achieve mankind's goal of happiness. However, Republican politicians vote against God's plan and mankind's goal. Even evangelical Republican preachers don't want parishioners to be happy. They want parishioners to be miserable. So they go to church, pray for relief, and put 10% of what they stole, overcharged, or conned out of people in the offering basket. Preachers and priests also want people of other religions to be miserably unhappy, so they violate constitutional separation of church and state by lobbying uh, re Republicans to pass laws impo imposing evangelical Christian immoral mores onto people of other religions, agnostics and atheists. Mores was violate God-given natural law ingrained in God-given human DNA. Natural law is based upon human instincts and inclinations that are ingrained in DNA. However, Old and New Testament of the Bible don't have commandments or Christian principles supporting mores against alcohol, social drugs, gambling, prostitution, and sex. Those mores turn otherwise law-abiding uh, people into criminals and cause criminal subcultures so people can obtain what has been made illegal. Mores for prohibition against alcohol, even though Christ drank wine. Prohibition caused Italian, Irish, and Jewish mafias. Mores against self-medication via God-created marijuana, coca, and poppy plants, and God-given science that allows humans to turn grain into beer, grape juice into wine, coca plants into cocaine, poppy plants into opium and heroin, and marijuana into hashish. Mores against social drugs at, uh, mores against social drugs added Japanese, Chinese, Russian, and Ukrainian mafias in the United States. Uh, mores against alcohol and social drugs caused mafia turf wars, robberies, burglaries, and murders to pay high costs for dr social drugs, deaths from polluted or too potent social drugs whose manufacturing is not regulated by the Federal Drug Administration, murders and disabling, disabling of those who cannot pay high interest loan charging loans from the mafia. Evangelical mores against gambling but the rich 1% devils can gamble on stocks, commodities, and cause stock market crashes that economically cripple the poor, working poor, and middle class, while 1% devils get richer when stock prices go down and then back up. Mores to outlaw the, outlaw the oldest profession, prostitution. So wives who has, whose husbands were killed in wars and unwed mothers who would not be able to on our national law, natural law, based upon God-given DNA and great instincts and inclinations to feed, clothe, house, and provide medical treatments for their children. But prostitution should be legal and regulated by government health agencies to prevent spread of sexual diseases. St. Augustine's rules against sex became Judeo-Christian mores against sex. Violate, they violate natural law based upon God-given DNA and grace, sexual instincts, and, and inclinations. Believe it or not, Puritans sailed to, the, to America in 1620 to escape English sex patrols that arrested people for having fun during sex. Because, and Puritans came to America because they believed God wanted humans to enjoy sex. Moses broke the tablet of Ten Commandments because pagan Jews were having sex in front of a golden calf of fertility. A book, The Ancient World of the Celts, reveals that before Europeans converted to Christianity, they were pagan cults who worshipped male gods and Lesacla Femme, the, the sacred feminine. Celtic women women were as tall, strong, and fierce and as fierce 
warriors as men. Female Celts had equal rights with men. They could marry the man who was their soulmate, vote, go to school, own property, and were warrior queens, warriors, council members, doctors, mediators, judges, etc. Sex with the, the sacred feminine was considered a spiritual experience that brought couples closer to God, godliness, heaven on earth, and heaven. However, St. Augustine wanted to replace the sacred feminine sexual path to heaven uh, into a belief in Christ is a divine path to heaven. Judeo-Christian men who felt inferior to sacred Celtic women converted pagan Celts into Christians so men would be superior to women. To achieve that goal, Judeo-Christian men eliminated equal rights for women and made them inferior slaves and servants to men. Those sexual rules which became judicial Christian mores against sex said you can't be spiritual and, pre- and sexual. So priests and nuns could no longer get married and have extramarital affairs. And then another rule against sex is sex is only for pro- procreation. So masturbation, contraceptives, premarital sex, and sex just for fun are sins that lead to a sinful life and hell. Because sexual mores mores violate natural law based upon God-given DNA and great sexual instincts and inclinations, anti-sexual mores have caused dozens of kinds of psychiatric disorders, a 50% divorce rate, forcible rape against 25% of women, rape by false pretense of love, incest, and pedophilia. Mores that outlaw abortions violate natural law DNA and great instincts for self-preservation and natural law DNA inclinations not to be victims of rape, incest, or pedophilia, and not to be further victimized by being forced to bear and raise babies spawned by rape, incest, or pedophilia. So anti-abortion laws and mores that violate natural law are immoral because they victimize women in many ways. A high percentage of females die without abortion. It's also immoral to force females who were victims of rape, incest, or pedophilia to be further victimized by being forced to bear and raise a, a rapist spawn including victims of forcible rape, unconscionable victims of rape due to a man uh, getting them drunk on alcohol or giving them uh, rape drugs, victims of rape by false pretense of love, incestuous rape, pedophilia rape, and anti-abortion laws against those types types of rape immoralize immorally victimizes girls and women in many ways. Rape is an assault on the female bodies and minds. Being forced to bear and raise a rapist baby is mentally, physically, and economically torturous. Medical research has not ruled out that rape DNA predisposition can be inherited by babies, so female victim, or females are victims of, of worry about baby growing up to be a rapist who makes other females uh, victims of rape. It is also immoral to force females to bear and raise uh, babies of rape when they don't want to or are economically or mentally unable to raise children. Those children will likely not be civilized and socialized or or supervised and become criminals. However, Evangelical Christian Republicans want criminal children in prison or ex- executed, especially when they are not Caucasians. But ironically, Evangelical Republicans, Republicans don't prevent children from becoming a criminal because they vote against contraceptives, financial assistance for child care, Medicaid, welfare, education, food, clothing, shelter, and other programs to prevent children from becoming criminals. Now, as to uh, the news media crisis, 
uh, First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution includes freedom of press because mm-hmm. as because as the Declaration of Independence reveals, King George of England ordered British troops to destroy printing presses and murder newspaper publishers who support American independence and oppose the king's violations of dozens of Englishmen's rights. Therefore, founding fathers of the U.S. Constitution created four separate branches of government, present to implement and administer the laws, a House of Representatives and Senate, to create laws and establish a budget for the U.S. government, a court system that includes the Supreme Court to make sure that laws don't violate U.S. Constitution, as well as criminal courts and civil courts. Founding fathers not only gave each of those three branches of government checks and balances to make sure the other two branches honor the U.S. Constitution, but also for the press to be an independent fourth branch of government to warn the public, especially voters, when the other three branches of government are unfaithfully executing their duties. Unfortunately, during recent decades, a significant percentage of the press and other news media have not functioned as a fourth branch of government, the most anti-Christ, traitorous, Unconstitutional news media, such as Fox News, do not warn the public when Republican President Trump, as well as Republican legislatures, justices, and judges, violated all six goals of the preamble of the U.S. Constitution, 13 of its provisions, all freedoms and rights in the Bill of Rights, and violated eternal law, 15 commandments, and nine principles of Christ, And therefore, Fox News and other Republican propaganda news media are treasonous antichrist traitors. And ironically, to violate the commandment, do not bear false witness by saying saying moral, objective, and constitutional news media issue fake news. When in reality, Fox News and other Republican propaganda machines are the only sources of fake news. Dangers of Republican fake news propaganda were explained by my father, hardcore Republican father, who was a propaganda expert during World War II. He was a lieutenant supervisor of the Office of War Information in the U.S. Embassy in London. Dad and his friends, his intelligence and propaganda colleagues, created and disseminated pro-ally and anti-propaganda, I'm sorry, they disseminated pro-alley and anti-axis propaganda. Dad wrote on December 24, 1945, to his highly educated parents the following letter. One second, uh, Curtis. One of the things, and, and you have given us uh, a huge amount of information here, and a lot of people are probably wondering, you know, this is this is a, a lot, and um, <clears throat> I agree with them, and I agree with you. There's a lot of a lot of media, a lot of uh, I, you know, like the Bible said, we live in a fallen creation. There's a lot of uh, lies, a lot of misconception, a lot of fake news, and that's part, right, of of what we live in nowadays. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you, and I know. Uh, you have uh, you you have a very organized mind and, and uh, you know how to answer this. You've done this before. Do you consider Curtis uh, yourself a spiritual person? Well, um, I think about it a lot. Yes. I mean, I don't go to church every Sunday because of what that preacher had said. Uh, you know, but uh, I I live by 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 the commandments and, and principle of Christ. So, uh, and, and that's really what I what my question. I was guess if I, I am a spiritual person, it's it, it's a spiritual person who wants to help other people save the future of our country. Okay. 
Well, fair enough, and and I, I respect your, I respect your answer, and I respect what you're saying. Absolutely, and, and a lot of people have a different concept of what a spiritual is. And again, you said you want to be able to be good to others and, and uh, put forth uh, our country. And I, again, I respect that hugely. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I find that you're you're very uh, passionate and you're very uh, goal oriented and you know what what is right for this country you know what it is uh legal and you know what is uh is right do you consider curtis that uh we are living uh definitely the last days of of humanity uh as as a as a spiritual person you you did reiterate to me that church it isn't really what it was, it's supposed to be a lot of denominations and a lot of preachers and a lot of pastor has obviously fallen away from the uh, the main purpose but do you believe and that's my question to you do you believe that we are living the last days of humanity as per what the bible and and i know that you've done a lot of research are we living the last days, Curtis? I don't really think so. I think that there are enough people who are, who are saying what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the uh, the the poll, the voter polls for the next uh, election in November indicate that the American uh, population is shifting away from you know, the immoral and unconstitutional uh, people in this country. And uh, and there's enough politicians, Democratic politicians, talking about saving democracy. So, no, I don't think so. I think enough people are, are realizing at, at what could have been the last moment. I mean, right. if, if, if uh, Donald Trump had and his... And his uh, right wing, uh, you know, what whatever they they're called, you know, succeeded in overthrowing our government. Yeah, we would be going to a point where, you know, Caucasians, you know, males were, were would turn the rest of, of Americans into their slaves. You know, I mean, George Orwell warned us about that. In the books 1984 and Animal Farm. Uh. Gotcha. And, and again, I respect your answer. I respect uh, your point of view, and I respect where you stand. And again, everyone, uh, for you that are listening, uh, you are probably getting tons of information uh, and, and a lot of things to dissect and to analyze. Again, take it and do your own research. And as Curtis, uh, international author Curtis uh, Wood has explained to you, uh, there is uh, a bit of research for you to do it on yourself. The Book, everyone. Uh, it is definitely and uh, on Amazon, and, and it's uh, it's called One uh, Percent Devils and Their Satanic Tools. Um, Curtis, I wanted to ask you uh, why the title, and have you received any uh, negative or perhaps positive? Uh, feedback on the title on, on the book ex itself. So question number one is why is the title and how controversial was it was the title? So two questions. Why the title? Uh, question number one. Okay, just a second. Let me uh, I mean, I, there's so many things to talk about that I had to uh, put some note sounds. So let me I, just... right, of, course, of course, we have to get ourselves organized. And I know we're going to go back to the letter that your dad wrote back on December 24. But uh, I just wanted to make sure that people that are listening to us get the title, get why, and obviously go and and purchase on Amazon. I that's I assume that's where the book is. So what why the title and have have you received any feedback or or or, or negative uh feedback of from the book? 
Okay. One um, percent devils in their satanic tools is the title of the book, and I haven't uh, gotten any negative criticism about my book. In fact, one hundred uh, uh, professional book reviews gave me uh, mostly five star, but also four star uh, recommendations on my book. And the reason I wrote uh, gave the, my book uh, the title of One Percent Devils and Their Satanic Tools yes. is because religions teach us that devils and satans destroy what God created. Our founding fathers, based upon God-given Judeo-Christian commandments and Christian pr principles, voted to approve the Declaration of Independence and Constitution because of what the, the King of England was doing. Uh, to English American colonists, and uh, and the uh, founding so the founding fathers wanted to replace King George's government with a socialistic democracy because they concluded that Judeo-Christian colonists would be better evaluators of how governments can help people, and so Americans would vote for people who would protect God-given freedoms, rights, family, economic, personal, and social needs and, go and interests. And, however, 1% devils and their satanic tools are anti-Judeo-Christian traitors who violate God's given commandments, Christian principles, and the U.S. Constitution. And as I said before, those devils and satanic tools want to replace socialistic democracy with kings of in industry and finance rulers who would be as tyrannical and evil as King George, Nazis, and communists. Uh, I could go on if, uh, with that answer with more, if you want. Uh and, and I, th I think we have we have basic covered. And again, we don't want to give the whole book away because we want to be able to get people uh, uh, interested, more interested, and in obviously do their their own purchase. Before I forget, <laughs> the book is found in Amazon.com. Anywhere else, that can somebody get your book, uh, Curtis? What's that? Uh, the book can be found on, um, on Amazon.com. Is, is there anywhere else that people can get the book? Oh, well, it's um, it's published by Page Turner uh, Media and Press. Wonderful. Okay, so we will have uh, the links, everyone, uh, for you to be able to get your copy uh, right on authors, the Authors Den podcast website and for you to be able to uh, get that information. Um, Curtis, a lot of people are, are wondering, and or they will be wondering once they hear uh, this, uh, this interview, what, what kind of research have you done uh, for this book? How do you back back? Uh, how do you back up all this uh, incredible information? What where have you found all this? This uh, or is obviously it's not something that came uh, from your mind, right? Uh, so love to find out what kind. Uh, how have have you researched this book, and how what kind of research? Where have you found all this information? Well, um, I researched a book by watching MSNBC, uh, the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, and by reading the Bible, Declaration of Independence, U.S. Constitution, American history, world history, the Celtic history, military history and genealogy books about my ancestors who were founding fathers and had migrated to the American colonies from 1620 to 1751. And I reread uh, books, law review articles, and eight papers I wrote. And that's that's really the main source of, of my, uh, my research for this book. And that's... Uh, that's Surprise, and that's definitely uh, 
the go to and and uh how long have have you have taken you uh to come with the uh this work of art how long has it taken you to write this book oh i guess it took me about 2 years wow that's incredible that's incredible it's a lot of work oh lark uh, what uh, i the... i wound up with 700 pages Wow. But they told me that first time uh, writers should only write uh, books that are like 300 to 350 pages long. So I had I edited a book down from 700 pages to uh, 350 pages. Incredible. Wow. Good for you. Good for you. Uh, Curtis, what does literally uh, literacy success look like to you? Well, I, I, two things, I guess. Um, achieving immor- immortality by writing a best-selling book that wins a Pulitzer Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, and is required reading for high school, college, university students, and future generations of stu- students ad infinitum, in other words, for, forever. And since... Nationwide elections occur every two years. Literary, literary success would be achieved by moral patriotic politicians, preachers, and press recommending that every voter read or reread my book because too many voters have amazingly short memories. As such, they become victims of Republican lies and Machiavellian divide and conquer tactics. So that's about it. Got it, got it. Um, and you know what? Information. And of course, uh, literary success also means that some, some uh, right wing Republican doesn't blow my brains out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, we're not going to go there, and uh, we hope and pray that that uh, that never happens. So, yes. Yeah. By the um, way, I I grew up in a county that was so Republican that the Democrats didn't even have an office, and uh, and my my family ever since many of them fought in the Civil War have been Republicans ever since then. So I mean, it's it's not like I. Uh, you know, I'm naturally automatically against Republicans. I mean, you know, it was Richard Nixon that changed me from being a Republican. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Um, Curtis, uh, what would you say, and I think that all of us, uh, we write, um, including myself, that we have challenges and we have uh to overcome different different challenges i don't i can't figure it out another word to use to to be able to write to be able to get enlightened and especially when we're writing a testimony or when we're writing uh doing research there's always always challenges and for people out there everyone uh this is this is a a, a senior a lot of education lots of uh, background I I assume that he has challenges himself. So for you that is listening to us on the other side of the world, um, Australia, uh, England, uh, Africa, and South America, uh, you are probably thinking uh, writing is seems easy for Curtis Wood and for Lizzie, uh, but it isn't. We always have a roadblock. We have our challenges. What would you say that was your greatest? challenge Curtis uh in writing this book. What what was so hard that you thought maybe I shouldn't continue? I'd love to hear uh your answer on this question. Well my greatest challenge was writing a book that it addresses every contemporary political, religious, news media and economic problem and issue. And it was also challenging to find the perfect words and citations from other publications to support what I wrote. And of course, editing the book down from 700 pages to 350 pages was real hard because I was leaving out a, a lot of things that that uh, were important. 
But I had to make choices as to which was the most important. And you hit it right on the nail. Sometimes we have to make choices uh, to the reader, to ourselves. We have to be true to ourselves. What is the best choice to do? What is the best thing that is going to touch, is going to speak to, is going to um, enlighten somebody? And uh, that's, I believe that's the toughest challenge, obviously, obviously. And uh, on that note, kind of as a segue to this question, um, which is probably, was there any time in your life where the, your ideas and beliefs uh, were challenged? Because we're talking politics and there's a as a as a Christian or as a believer, as a born again, however you might want to call it, we have um, we ha- we ha- we have challenges, and we have to pick. You know, what is the right thing to do, or the Christian thing to do, and and follow into the steps of you know the book, which is the Bible, uh, and we we get we get uh, we get. We don't know what to do, uh, you know. Just sometimes, just prayer, right, uh, to answer those questions. But was there any time in your life that uh, your ideas and belief were challenged, uh, Curtis? Oh, sure. Um, when I was uh, an expert in criminal justice, based upon my education and and work experience. Uh, I wrote New Jersey's Criminal Justice Standards and Goals uh, for crime prevention, law enforcement, prosecution, defense attorneys, courts, correctional institutions, and uh, victim assistance. Uh, So I got a lot of uh, resistance to standards and goals by professionals. and uh, when I preferred, I also, uh, my ideas were, and beliefs were challenged. When I was a, a nationally known accident defense attorney, you used uh, uh, medical book, books to prove that uh, injury claims for fraud were uh, When I preferred and tried fraudulent accident injury claims, uh, I had a lot of resistance, you know, from institutionalized fraud, you know, that judges accepted, that plaintiffs and other defense attorneys accepted. And uh, so judges, I had many hundreds of cases where judges refused to dismiss the case because there was no scientific basis uh by the plaintiff's uh, medical expertise uh, for claiming that certain conditions were caused by an accident. Fortunately, uh, judges who uh, refused to apply the requirement that uh, doctors' opinions be based upon uh, medical research, but when they after they did that in 100 straight uh, cases, I won jury trials because the jurors uh, followed the law that the judge wouldn't follow. So that's that's pretty tough stuff. Uh, but you know, I, the, before my body was was too broken up to continue sports. You know, I everybody expected I would be a professional football player or or a uh, Olympic uh, half half mile uh, winner, uh, but when I could no longer physically continue with sports, you know, that motivation to win sublimated into a motivation to win in trial cases. So that's that's about all I can say about that. 
Well, it, it, I, I, I'm very, very happy for you to be able to share that your life actually took uh, 360 from somebody that uh, was kind of ready and prepared to lead a professional athlete uh, life to somebody who uh, turned it to an attorney or a defense attorney and, and be, in, be in court. So that's definitely a, a big change in your life. And uh, now uh, an international with lots of accolade writer, uh, you know, God definitely had um, a different plan for you. And, and uh, obviously we hope and pray that is for the glory and praise of the Lord. That's, uh, that's, that is incredible. Um, very surprised to know that. And, and good for you for being able to, to switch and to accommodate your life in different ways, knowing that, uh, you had limitation due to your health and due to injuries. So that is very interesting to know. Um, on, on, you know, we're, talk, we're talking about challenges, and, and you did mention about your belief that you didn't want to jeopardize your belief, especially being an attorney. But, um, um, you know, how do you – this is actually a really good segue, too. How do you handle Curtis' criticism? Because from somebody who had their life – going in one direction to a completely different direction and now a writer uh, a lot of people are probably thinking you know curtis what is it <laughs> what are you going to be doing when you grow up but uh, is it is it this is it that or is it that how do you handle criticism people that uh are probably can't figure it out where you fit and obviously you know where you fit but uh, I'd love to hear your answer and it's uh, something that uh, can definitely benefit all of us that are listening to us right now how do you handle criticism well, let me start out first with with a funny answer uh, I became so good at at discussions and arguments that I could I could make people who I suspected had much higher IQs believe that they had lost the discussion or at least question whether they were right. But from a more serious uh, <laughs> uh, uh, how do I handle criticism? Well, I prevent it. And mm. as the viewers said, I used words and citations from other books to support opinions so well that I eliminated the chance for uh, the chance for anyone to issue a literary criticism, and and as some of those book reviewers said, you know, just as I was getting to the point of having of questioning uh, something that Mr. Woods had said, he suddenly answered my my question. <laughs> so yeah, I uh, try to prevent <laughs> criticism, but you know. I was told once long ago that uh, if you're correct in 51% of the time, that uh, mm -hmm. you should, you know, you you could become rich on on the on the stock market. And uh, uh, I had some other idea, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> Yes, and, and I think that's uh, that's the right way of putting it right now. A lot of us uh, have uh, handled criticism uh, different ways, and for whatever is it that we do in life, whether it's just uh, running a talk show like myself or writing books that are not to the agreement of everyone, I think we should, you know, start creating a thicker skin. If uh, God has put in your heart to do something, to write a book, uh, or, or to follow your passion, I mean, we always have to uh, make sure that that's what God wants in your life, and, and just get that thick skin, absolutely, uh, and uh, take it as a grain of salt, like I said it earlier, but uh, this is this has been incredible. Curtis, um, don't want to forget, uh, for uh, people that are listening to us later uh, in the show because this is recorded uh, again the book can be found in amazon um anyway uh, do you have a a website or an email that you would like to share with the audience oh boy <laughs> uh people can reach I, out i don't know because uh 
I hate the internet. I understand. And, I understand. And, so for and every, that, every time I go on the internet, I've got to delete, you know, five five hundred emails uh, to get to what what I needed to to find. Of of, of course. So for people that would but like I, to I'm get saying, a, I'm, what I'm thinking about doing is is uh, having. Uh, Uh, providing a, a post box so that uh, uh, people who want to communicate me can can uh, send letters and uh, and that's about it. <laughs> that's right. The old the old fashioned way, uh, pen and pencil, and that's how uh, some of us like absolutely, absolutely, uh, but. The book is, is on Amazon, uh, and in this recording, it is on uh, the um, website, which is the author's den, uh, which you will be able to definitely get a hold of. Um, absolutely. So just make sure that you follow us. Uh, we are on all social media. We are on all social media, and uh, we are definitely able to connect with you for you to be able to follow us all over the Internet. Curtis, it's been an incredible, incredible um, uh, now, and I think we have to get a lot of information more than you ever bargain uh, so I I love what you have shared with us today and uh, I think that people are going to get a, a lot of benefit any last word my friend yeah uh, I was just trying to say before that uh, you know when I was 21 my brother and I had used up all of our nine cat lives, and I began to wonder if God was saving myself from my recklessness to do something important. And um, in my heart, I think that this book is what God uh, saved my life for, and if that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting, you know, I definitely believe that nothing happens for an accident. And as a believer myself, uh, you know, we read there is not a hair in our head that falls and a leaf from the tree that doesn't fall if it's not God's will. I believe that we all have a purpose to be able to yeah. witness and to tell our truth, uh, whether some people agree or, or, or disagree, uh, the truth will set you free as, again, as the good work word, uh, the book, good book says. Um, and, uh, it, it is a part of human, humanity to be able to, uh, respect and, and accept other people's, uh, decisions and other people's, uh, um, information. And, um, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you had a calling and you had a, uh, a definitely a, a purpose to to be able to be here to share it with us. And, and I believe that not everybody uh, will like what we're saying. And we respect that. Absolutely. Um, but this is this, this show is not for everyone. And I believe that if there is one life, one soul, uh, perhaps in the other side of the, the world that uh, will identify it and will be able to connect with us. I think our job is complete. You know, the work has been done, and one person is suffice to be able to share what uh, what you have done, which is an extensive and very, very, very important work. So I appreciate you for that. Um, you deserve another round of applause for your work, and I appreciate you being here with us uh, on your busy schedule, sharing so much information. Well, I, I must say uh, that um, a psychiatrist uh, Sigmund Freud would agree with you. He said there's no such thing as accidents. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. 
Um, thank you so much, and uh, uh, we will speak behind the scene for a little bit. And guys, thank you so much for what uh, for listening. And uh, we will be back with another guest uh, soon here on the Authors Den. I'm your host, Lizzie. Um, bye bye for now. Thank you for listening to another exciting episode of the Authors Den podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show so you don't miss any of our future episodes. That's all for now. We'll see you next time.